I'm Michelle from the Starling Tribune, a proud member of the Gundagic Network. Just like the show you're listening to now, the opinions expressed are those of each individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnerGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in three, two, one. Hello and welcome to episode 81 of Better Podcasting. We'll be playing SimCity Podcast Edition for the next hour as we go over how to build a community around your show. In this week's Better Podcasting download, we've got some important information about Google and RSS feeds. You don't want to miss this. Finally, in our Better Podback, we go over tons of your great feedback. Let's start the episode now. Welcome to Better Podcasting, a show where we talk about podcast tips, tools, and best practices to help you succeed with your podcast. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we podcast purely out of the love and fun of it. Podcasting is our hobby, and we recognize that it's yours too. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. Here's your host for the show, Stephen John Drew and Stargate Pioneer. Hello and welcome to episode number 81 of Better Podcasting. My name is Stephen John Drew and with me is the Stargate Pioneer. You don't have to do a podcast from Hawaii to have a good time. This is also our unofficial start to summer 2017. It's Memorial Day weekend here in the United States, and we are ready to have a rocking summer. We got some great things in store for you throughout the summer through this podcast, and I can't wait to get started, Stephen. I decided to just freeze there and and leave silence because you did such a good job of setting that up that I thought, why not? Totally wreck it down, wreck it and knock it down. But uh, no, we're here today with episode 81 of Better Podcasting. And yeah, a lot of fun topics. As we mentioned, you're going to want to check out that download. It's uh, something that was very surprising to us. But we are going to kick off this summer in the best way possible. We are going to give away stuff. What? Yeah. Yeah, we're back to the giveaways. I have with me the vaunted, the wonderful Audio Technica ATR2100 USB slash XLR microphone, and it is ours to give away. Oh, but wait, there's more because of the noted pop issues with the microphone. We got ahead and we are giving away a windscreen not a pop filter but a windscreen to go with it it makes shipping a little bit easier for me so there you go the atr 2100 can't be yours if you get back to us why did you or if you haven't started yet why would you start a podcast now get these reasons into us by july 27th 2017 and you will be entered into the giveaway for the atr 2100 yay Woo! It is definitely summer, and you know, I'm doing the nice thing today. By the way, I just want to specify this for all you Canadian listeners that yes, we have our little secret here that we're just appeasing Stargate Pioneer. You know, he's like, oh, it's the kickoff to summer, but we all know that Canada does things just a little bit better. So we started ours a week earlier last week. So uh, yeah, you guys go ahead and and enjoy week two of summer. Now let me ask you this. Is there really summer in Canada? Because I don't think it is. I think it's a myth. I think your igloo that you live in would melt and it would be all sorts of trouble. No, no, there's summer. It just means that you go from two layers of ice to one. It's just uh, one less uh, layer. I, 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 get, I, I see. I see. You get to take off the snowmobile shirt in the in the middle of the day, but you got to put it back on before you go home for dinner. <laughs> Yeah, so please do get in touch with us and send us your entry, uh, video, audio, text. We don't care. Just let us know through any of the different uh, through contest at betterpodcasting.com is the best way to get that to us because we might miss them elsewise. But yeah, contest at betterpodcasting.com. We want to hear from you and tell us why did you or why did would you want to start a podcast? So this is going to be a ton of fun and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Now, we also have a bit of feedback here that... We've been soliciting for a while, and it is a question about 
What do you think of numbering? With episode numbering, it's a very hot topic, and we're going to actually come back to that towards the end of the show, but I thought we should just start off with a clip, a voicemail that we got asking, uh, answering this very question, do you think that podcasts should be numbered? And we have a very astute clip. Gentlemen, this is the army. I number. Wow. So thank you very much for that, Diami. It is a great segue into our main topic. And then we'll come back and revisit this during our better pod back. Here we go. This is indeed a topic that I've wanted to cover for a while. But the reason that we're doing it right now is it was actually suggested by a listener. Yes. Jeannie, who is the main host and producer of Tyrion's Landing, reached out and said, hey, guys, why didn't you tackle building a community? I thought, great idea, Jeannie. I wanted to do this for a while, but because you suggested it, we're going to move it up. So whether your goal for a podcast is for a hobby, for fun, or you're trying to monetize something, a community surrounding your show will definitely enhance the experience and the audience experience and will let you achieve your goals a little bit easier. So community interaction is a phenomenal to use a military term force multiplier to enhance your show's message because you will have a lot of people talking about it. Now, feedback to your show, as you note, with better podcasting injects life and flavor. It's not just the raw uh, steak. It's the nice steak sauce that you put on it. And otherwise, it would be a boring, snoozing, one-way conversation between us and you. And we don't want that on this show. And we don't want your show to be that way either. Unless you're the most phenomenal speaker and entertaining speaker ever. To get that feedback really helps quite a bit. Now, Stephen, podcasting has been called a personal medium. And Stephen, do you know what that means? Can can you enlighten the listener a little bit? I actually don't know what that means. Oh, I see. So I am going to drop some knowledge on you right here. So personal medium basically means that most people experience podcasts on their own. They're in their car alone. They're running or working out alone. They're working at their desk at work with earphones on. So generally, it's not an open community experience. You're not experiencing a movie or a film or a TV show with the family or your friends. It's just you and the podcast. No, that's I, I you misunderstood my reply. I knew the definition of it, but I didn't understand it because me and all of my friends every Friday we get together. I invite my family and my friends all together and we all sit around an iPod and we listen to your shows. So that's what we do. It's not personal for us because that's what we do every Friday. I have heard that, that listening to the Stargate Pioneer is a community experience because it is a, is a great one to MS3TK and jest at me as I go through the podcast. So it's such a personal medium that if you create this community like you did on Friday nights listening to my shows, that it enhances the listeners enjoyment of the shows and their ability to experience the shows. And let's face it, building a community can provide a central hub for the topics that you are discussing that is central to your show as well. So we're going to get into how to measure success, how to build a community, and what are some tips to do it correctly, and then summarize everything in the end. So first of all, let's talk about metrics. So one of my first podcast mentors and friends, quite frankly, Chuck Cage, and he created Galactic Water Cooler, which was formerly known as Galactica Water Cooler. He also did the Toolmonger podcast and website, and he was also one of the original popular science podcasters. Now, he graduated in the spring of 2013 from the University of Texas at Dallas's Emerging Media and Communications Department. Now, he shared with me his capstone honors project that he wrote a thesis, and it was entitled Interpreting and Defining Measures of Community uh, Success. So interpreting and defining measures of community success. And in the paper, Chuck goes into metrics 
for an online community. And then these metrics can include size, participation, contributions from members, sustainability of the community, health of the community, the sense of community that you obtain by being part of the community, and then expanding the community beyond your immediate circle. So the friends of your friends of your friends of your friends. Okay, well, that's all just friends. You have to expand it beyond that to people, especially when you're talking about an online medium that is truly worldwide. So these metrics you have to keep in the back of your head on how successful your community is, and you're going to have to define them for your individual community as well. There's no standard uh, definition for any of these metrics, but metrics have to be achievable and they should be measurable. So keep that in mind as you go forth. So it is important to consider these metrics and you have to keep an eye on them as your community continues because then you can properly grow it, or if it's declining a little bit, you can reshape it and possibly regrow it again or grow it bigger. And you just want to help shape your community positively, whatever that positive is in terms of your definitions. So, Stephen, how do you think about positivity in developing a community? Well, I think one of the best ways to develop your community is and do that positively is to involve yourself in the community. Now, the reason why I think that this is such an important thing is because you actually involving yourself into topics within your community is showing that you care about them, right? You're showing that you're taking your time to actually interact with them and engage. So I think that's a huge thing. You know, even if you're in a debate or anything, it's still positive. You're showing them that you care enough to reach out and be a part of it. Uh, you need to make sure when you're doing that, um, you can pay attention to where your audience is at as a podcaster, because some people find that their community ends up primarily maybe on their website, uh, in the comments thread, or maybe it's on Twitter or Facebook. There's a lot of different ways where you can involve yourself and actually engage in those topics. And you got to find what's right for your podcast. Uh, it's kind of weird. All of a sudden we're noticing that we're getting a lot more emails and voicemails now uh, to, to us on this show. And so that's something that it looks like our community is kind of switching to the email route again, which is really odd. So you want to make sure that you are involving yourself in those. Yeah. And when you're being involved, you want to be approachable. Nobody wants to break through a brick wall. Nobody wants to say, oh, they're not really listening to me. So be approachable, be uh, conversational and make sure that your community members are feeling welcomed. Even if it's a negative sort of interaction, you still want to be welcoming into the community as a whole. Or if they're just spamming, then you get rid of them. But that's spamming. And we're not <laughs> talking about that. We're not talking about the band spam hammer. And also responding to listener feedback, You, in order to keep this up over time, you, in order to prime the pump, you need to set aside time each day to engage with your audience outside of your show. I mean, if you're doing a daily show, that's one thing, but I'm assuming that you're a hobby podcaster and you're going maybe once a week, maybe once a month. So you have to take time every day to do this. And this is gets back to remember the golden rules of hobby podcasting. Stephen, and I said only do two shows you know, for for you as a hobby podcaster. This is part of it because you have to set aside time each day to promote your show and also to engage with your audience. And this is part of that. And then when your audience gives you feedback for your show, mention it on the show. We have an entire segment, Better Pod Back, that we go over the feedback that we receive on the show. So you need to think about how you want to either do something like that or creatively involve the feedback into your show. And then not only mention it, but encourage it. Say, hey, look, you can get us at podcast at betterpodcasting.com or you can catch us on Twitter. Or you can, we have a voicemail line, which we don't on this po podcast, but we're available to send an email with a link to Dropbox or your media storage uh, <laughs> thing of, of your choosing and send us a link and, and we'll uh, uh, download that voicemail and we will play it or that audio clip and we will play it. So mention their show or their episode as you're doing that. And also if there's reviews to your show, mention that. And as I mentioned before, even if you get a negative feedback, even if you get some negative email, sometimes it's great to respond to that because you want to show that interaction that you're willing to expand your horizons into their way of thinking, although you might not necessarily want to put it on your show. No, 
But it's, you know, I've heard lots of stories of people replying to people who have commented in a negative fashion, and that person just turns around and says something even more negative. But um, it, again, shows them that you're at least taking time to consider what they're saying. So I think that that's a really important thing is, is don't just focus on the positive either, because uh, there's a, an old fact, and I wish I remembered the exact number, but it's something like every person with a bad experience will tell five people. Uh, somebody with a good experience will tell one. And it's the same thing with your podcast. If, if they think that you're just cold and ignoring them, that's something that who knows what they're going to say behind the scenes. So uh, it's a great point, SP. Now, the other thing that you might want to do while you're trying to build this community is creating your own central hubs. Now, what we mean by that is if you make it easier for the audience to gather because they're already sharing a passion, you know that you know that your audience is all sharing the same like and desire because they're checking out your show so if you make a forum or a facebook group or a google plus community rip google sorry that's for the future when when that's true uh you could even enable web page comments and uh, by the way rip google plus not google google will be around stealing our data forever um you you can just invite them to to be a part of this because again you know that they're sharing an interest as it is. So that's a really good thing is if you can even just make a Facebook group, even if it's an open one and people can come in and join and you can promote it, then you're getting all these like-minded individuals together. And hey, what do you know? They're talking to each other, maybe even talking about your podcast and you can kind of also get a gauge. Okay, so all of a sudden everybody's saying they hated when I talked about this. Now you know, you can shift that around a little bit. Um, you can also address them directly in those as well, which is super important because... If you get this thread in Facebook that people are all saying, yeah, why, why did you say this? If you actually went and did this instead, it would have solved your problem. Now you can go in and be like, thanks so much for that information. I appreciate that. I'm going to talk about that on the next podcast. And what are you doing there? Again, engaging them and making yourself approachable. You can also invite feedback, uh, as SP said, by mentioning it on your show. And that includes talking about all of these different options. But there's a super important footnote to that. You sometimes want to hone in on what you're trying to direct people to, because if you have a Google Plus community and you have a Facebook community and then you have a forum and you're telling everybody to go join on all three, is that really going to happen? Probably not. So you might want to limit that. I would limit the amount of places that I would send people to. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why. We purport getting a URL and saying your hobby podcast.com and send people to your website. And on a website, you can have links to wherever your community is forming, whether it's right there on the website, whether that's a forum, whether that's a Facebook group or whatever. So just limit that number of steps that your listener has to remember as they are trying to be part of your community. Definitely encourage community involvement. Note positive interaction between your listeners like Scott Smith, Joshua Listen. They were having this great discussion over on the podcast forum about the Sennheiser MD 46 or the latest television shows that have been canceled. It was a thread that Steven started on the on the the podcast forum dot com. So all great stuff. That has happened over there and you want to note that and you want to promote that because it's good interaction it's positive interaction and it shows people are interested in being part of your community you want to create special content only for your community your chosen community location wherever that is so like i was just saying there was definitely there are forums on there are threads on the podcast forum which we have created that are specifically meant to only be there. So we create uh, posts that people will respond to there. If you create a community on YouTube, now I don't know why you'd want to do this, but you could, if you create community on YouTube, then put only content for your community on YouTube, make special videos for you there. Now, if you are going down the road of Patreon, that is an easy thing to do as well. And you can create special community only events. Say I'm doing an entertainment podcast on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. When that puppy comes back in January, first week of January 2018, we could actually sit down and do a community 
watch for that. We can actually sit there and, and watch the show and tweet or respond as it goes. So if I would put that on the gunnageek.com website and only the gunnageek.com website, if that was the chosen location for the community of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is the podcast that I do on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that would be something that we could do. You could also create an actual in-person meetup, which you can go and you could watch this stuff as well. That has been done before. And then always, this is just we pounded this a couple of times already, but I'm just going to be very direct. Always treat your audience and community with respect and appreciation because they are not there to serve your purposes. You are there to serve them and be very appreciative of that and also respect them because they are respecting you with giving you your their time to listen to your podcast. Wait, so when I am just a part of the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. community because I'm not on that show... I'm supposed to be serving you like what do you want you want some beer root beer or what do you want like one I you didn't no, make no, it clear no, to no, me no 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 I you misserved me I said you as the host have to serve your community oh okay so you should be serving me when I'm listening to Legends of Zeal. okay that sounds good I'll make sure to note that back to you yeah, exactly <laughs> and that is why I keep trying to send you Molson and you say <laughs> that's like water up here <laughs> Uh, also, one other thing that we want to mention here is that you want to make sure that you know when things just need to be changed, because this is another important thing about your community, because it, it's really not it's an ongoing process. It's not a set it and forget it type thing. And you're going to need to go and sometimes make some changes. Now, I have built podcast communities. I've also built other communities, websites, forums. I, I've, I've got some experience with this. And I'll, I'll break it down to forums because back in the day when forums were a pretty big thing, I, I ran a couple of, of pretty popular forums and every now and then things would just start to stale a little bit. And what would we do? Well, we would go and maybe we would we would change some of the categories so that it's freshening it up or we would go. And if there was one super long thread, we might close that and make a new one. And why would we do that? Because that would encourage people to go and try to fill the new one. They would get a little competitive. Well, we want this thread back to 300 pages, you know, and, and it was things like that that sometimes needed to be done. Or we would all of a sudden see a group of topics coming up. And on that forum, we would go and we would build a new category for that. So now you've got a, a forum category that has no posts and people are like, well, let's fill that up. It's a great topic. Let's go post in there. So there's always things that happen as the communities start to get stale. The same thing here with your podcast. If you are in a situation that you're feeling like your, your uh, community is going a little bit dry, Maybe you need to go in there and just put like a really left field question to encourage people to come in, or you need to reach out specifically on your show and, and say, Hey, I noticed nobody's talking right now. What do you think about this? So then it encourages them to go back. So you really need to remember that you, sometimes your community will need to be changed or altered and you're going to have to maintain that. One of the great things that you are going to have to do as well is you might want to close off some stuff. I mentioned it at the beginning of the segment. If there is something that's not working, you might want to take that away to trim the fat or trim the unsuccessful part of your community away and focus on the successful part of your community in a forum that might be a thread that's just not getting any traction. It might be the fact that you have a Facebook group that's just not doing what you wanted to do. So you make it secret or you close it down or something like that. So it's not really open to the public and you try something else instead. You focus on your Patreon page or, or, or something like that. So there's a lot of things that you can do, but just keep in mind that when you close off part of your community, make sure you have a plan in place to replace it somehow, because you always want to be moving forward and you always want it to be growing instead of retracting. This is an ongoing process. This is not a set and repeat. This is something that you're gonna have to keep your eyes on continually. And once again, building a community is enhancing your show, your podcast, and whether you're making money on it or not. So you're already, your audience is already connected just by listening to you. And communities enhance your podcast and keep tabs on those metrics. You choose your metrics, whatever those metrics are, and then try to keep tabs on your community's health and sustainability. Uh, there are just many ways to build a community. We went over a few. I bet you there's a ton more out there. 
and just focus on the ways that best fits you and your show and then continue to foster your community long term. So, Stephen, if somebody has a great idea that we have not talked about, about building the community, what should they do? You should get in touch with us through any of the ways, but primarily send us an email to podcast at betterpodcasting.com. Please try to include a voicemail because then we can play it on the show. Of course, you can always write us an email as well or tweet us or Facebook us, but we would really like to have that voicemail clip. That would be a huge thing that, that would be appreciated because then we can play it on the show. We like to play audio so that it's not just two boring guys talking. No, no. And if you want to take that extra step and go to video, we would appreciate that as well. But definitely voice. If you're a podcaster and you don't know how to record your voice into something and send it somewhere, I think we need to talk to you. So let us know. Send us an email and we'll help you figure that out. Awesome. Well, that's going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Let's move into our better podcasting download. Welcome to this week's better podcast podcasting download all right so in this week's better podcasting download yeah as we mentioned it's something that you probably don't want to miss because we have honestly not heard about this yet this is crazy as the time recording today may the 26th 2017 we have not seen this talked about yet and and it's actually something that we have been sort of thinking about for a while, but we decided that we were just going to leave this can of worms closed, leave sleeping dogs laying, you know, all that other stuff that you say. And today we are reopening up the discussion about podcast RSS feeds and SEO. So SEO being search engine optimization. Now, what you might remember is that we kind of accidentally talked a little bit about this during episode 65 of Better Podcasting, where we talked about the pros and cons of self-hosting. Now, we very, very, very briefly mentioned that one thing to consider when you're self-hosting a podcast is potential SEO by having your RSS feed on your domain versus somewhere else. Now, when we said that, this was a very small consideration, just one teeny little element that we thought was something worth thinking about for the future, even, you know, future-proofing, all that stuff you don't know. And we were surprised at the backlash that we received about that. Apparently, it was a very hot topic. We did not realize that this was as hot of a topic as it was. And upon receiving feedback, we quickly realized how much how hot this fire was. And we got some comments on the for or sorry on the website. We got some emails. We even happened to notice this topic coming up in a couple other podcasts about podcasting shortly after we did our episode. Now maybe our senses were just heightened, or maybe we started something. Who knows? In either case, this really showed how hot of a topic this was. In fact, we even did a follow up in episode sixty six because of the amount of comments that we got. Now. One of the areas that we actually heard this mentioned about was on Libsyn's The Feed. Now, Libsyn's The Feed is a podcast that SP quite regularly listens to because we've talked about before. He's a big stats guy. Lots of information, really good information on there. I I say kudos to The Feed for always sharing that information. It's terrific to be able to hear that industry information from somebody who's actually hosting podcasts. That is huge. So great to see that information. And this was something that came up. Now, I'm only mentioning this because shortly after I heard this comment on the feed, what we discovered was all of a sudden people were sort of other people were saying this same the same exact quote that I'm about to share with you. And I think that a lot of people heard this and for good reason, you know, the feed has has showed themselves as somebody who does the research there it's a podcast that makes sure to give an informed opinion there's you know it's not just somebody ra- randomly spouting off stuff so they've they've got a history so if somebody says something on the on the feed you you tend to think that it's it's got a, a very good point to it so we're just going to go ahead and play you the clip cuz i don't want to get this wrong i do not want to say a paraphrasing of what was said on the feed and I can say steven that's not what they said so i'll just go ahead and play the, the section of episode 91 of the feed at this point Some of you are probably saying, but Rob, you and the SEO experts could be wrong. Or if you work for or have been brainwashed by another company that pushes the above SEO narrative, you are saying I am wrong. So to that end, this whole misguided myth, I was able to find this comment from Google's own John Mueller. Quote, 
If you are looking for a ranking boost by having an RSS feed, that's not going to happen. This RSS feed is really something we see as more of a technical help to crawl and index the content a bit better. There's no direct ranking boost for the website itself, unquote. Again, that is not from some random person on a Facebook group or someone trying to sell their service. That is from Google's John Mueller, who is Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google. So yeah, he knows a few things about this. As Adam Savage would say, myth busted. Myth and busted. And drops mic and walks away. Oh. <laughs> so, busted or busted for now? You know, let's go the American Idol, American Idol route, as Ryan Seacrest would say, for now. Because that's what he did at the end of American Idol. So there you go. Uh, the, the, here's the thing with that quote is... That quote is absolutely from a very reputable source, John Mueller. He is indeed part of Google. He is a webmaster trend, trend analyst, and he actually participates in, I think it's weekly or bi-weekly hangouts where people can just come in and ask questions. He is, it's a really neat thing. I've actually looked into a bunch of the videos since this quote, because uh, after this quote came up, I kind of wanted to find out what the source was. So I, I looked into it and I found a great little analyzing article called geeks.link slash podcast SEO. And what we found on there was the, the link to the actual video where, where John said this. And there is a very important I think note with what John is answering and I'm going to play you the exact clip of what, how this question came to John and how he answered. It's, it's about a minute long, but I, I do think it's very important before we get to actually the point that we're making today. Uh, is there any SEO benefit to having an RSS feed? So this is a, I think a good question uh, from in general, there, there are two aspects involved there. One is if you're looking for a ranking boost by having an RSS feed, that's not going to happen. The RSS feed is really something that we see more as a technical help to crawl and index the content a little bit better. So if you have a website that's changing content fairly quickly, if it's a news website, a blog that has a lot of new content, uh, maybe even a shop that has lots of new content, then the RSS feed really helps us to stay on top of things so that we can pick up all of those new URLs and crawl them uh, as soon as we can. So if we recognize that the RSS feed is working fine and we get a ping from the RSS, uh, for the RSS feed, then we'll pick up the RSS feed, we'll try to crawl those pages that are updated there maybe within seconds. So that's something that works really, really quickly. Uh, you can also, if you have a website that's updating a lot very quickly, uh, you can also use PubSub Hubbub to kind of uh, speed things up for the RSS feed so that you don't need to ping it separately. So that quote there it has a bit of jargon in it because it is about uh, it is a, a hangout gear towards webmasters because it's important to remember that RSS feeds are not just for podcasts. RSS feeds are used for a variety of different things, including websites. Now, with that said, if we look at the question that was asked, it was, is there any SEO benefit to having an RSS feed? Now, if we also look at the tail end of that, John is actually talking about benefits right in there. Like he's talking directly about whether or not you're going to get a boost by having one. And to me, that's more so answering for the webmasters. Like if I'm if I have a website now that doesn't have an RSS feed, do I benefit by adding an RSS feed? And I think I think that that's supported by his response there. The other thing as well with that is the more common question that comes up in the world of podcasting in regards to RSS feeds is, does the location of the RSS feed matter? So when we mentioned it in our context, we were saying that potentially having your RSS feed on your website might assist getting you assist with your SEO because you've got another item that's commonly being pinged on your actual website rather than somebody else. Now, again, uh, we are not, we've said this before, we're not SEO analysts, nothing like that, but we're just going based off of what we know and what we've seen. And so I think the questions are a little bit different. Now, there's another important footnote as well is that this was from April 11th, 2015, which was quite a while ago. And as people know, Google is always changing. Google changes things all the time. We've talked about recently how Google's made some changes. And that, after all of this setup, is finally 
getting us to our point that we wanted to make today on better podcasting, which was a discovery that we made. Isn't that right, Stargate Pioneer? Yeah, this was unexpected. Matter of fact, I didn't really realize it was a discovery until we started talking about it. But one of the things that is often discussed with RSS location and SEO is that Google won't show the results of the RSS feed because it's not re readable. However, in recent searches that we've been going through, and this might be a result of some of the changes that we previously talked about with Google, it might be a result of something else. We have no idea. We didn't actually reach out to Google to ask the question. We're just going on what we've noticed is that there has definitely been a change. Yeah. And I got to say, before all of these, these changes that we're talking about, I used to get Google to show up RSS feeds, but I usually had to add the term RSS feed. And when I showed, saw the result, it didn't always look the same. Like it was missing, you know, how you sometimes see results and it's missing a description or, it, you know, the titles formatted. It was kind of more along those lines. So while it was still there, it wasn't the most easy, easiest thing seen. And as of today, May 25th, 2017, we are noticing regular entries within Google of RSS feed results. Now this happened because I was actually doing a bit of search trying to find some back content um, for better podcasting. I was looking for a specific episode and I couldn't remember where I had it. So when I search for better podcasting, the way that I do that is I put in quotes the term better podcasting because the words better and podcasting are very vague. So if you don't put it in quotes, you get a whole bunch of other things a lot of times. So I just put that in and what did I see in the results? On page two, I saw a link to an RSS feed for better podcasting. Now, if you're watching the video side of things, this is actually a, a secondary RSS feed that I actually have set up at the moment um, for the You're Gonna Geek site. And there's a whole backstory. I'll, I'll tell you one on one if, you, if you'd like. But nevertheless, I saw an RSS feed. If I clicked on that, uh, that was something that actually took me directly to an RSS feed. So the code that is unreasonable, uh, readable, which is something that is regularly talked about was right there. So that was really kind of crazy to me because I thought to myself, well, okay, maybe that's because I set up that, that duplicate. Like maybe there's something like that weird going on. So I thought let's branch out here. And the first name that popped into my mind was friend of the show, Emily Prokop, the story behind podcast. So I decided to open up an incognito window because now I'm seeing this. I'm like, okay, let's see even clear everything. Go incognito, get rid of your, your cash and your cookies and all that and, and do that. And sure enough, what did I see there? Not only Emily's site as the first result, but within there, a direct link to the RSS feed. Now, Emily actually uses the Libsyn pages. What's nice about that is you get a, a bunch of different subcategories within the results showing different elements of the website. And right there was one to the RSS feed. And this, of course, was after I consulted with SP and I'm like, SP, this is weird. And, and SP said to me, OK, actually, you know what? I've noticed that too once or twice. So it's like, OK, well, we're on something. Let's look into this a little bit further. So I decided to check out Ask the Podcast Coach. This is a podcast that has uh, it's questions and answers from the podcast community. It's with Jim Collison and Dave Jackson. And what did I see on page number three? The same thing. Their Libsyn URL was showing as a result. It was askthepodcastcoach.libsyn.com slash RSS right there. Boom. So I thought, OK, so that is a site that is that is a podcast that has a good amount of community. And also what was very interesting about it, they have branched out on so many different sites before that I thought that there wouldn't be a chance of that showing up because they've been on a bunch of different streaming services. So I thought to myself, let's go big or go home. And I decided to try Chris Hardwick's Nerdist. Now, Chris Hardwick is somebody who he is a podcaster turned game show host slash talk show host. He's the guy behind the Talking Dead and all that stuff. Nerdist is a very big thing. And I typed in Nerdist. And what did I see on page two? Nerdist's Libsyn RSS feed right there. Now, Nerdist, again, massive entity, massive entity. And that means that Amongst all these other websites, including on this very same page, a Reddit po a Reddit page, an IMDB page, even Twitter was the RSS feed URL directly to it for their Libsyn page. Now, why I find this particularly fascinating is because, again, it is a massive, massive entity nerdist. 
And what is sitting there is their Libsyn RSS. So kudos to Libsyn for, for hosting Nerdist. That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, right there. Now, what does this mean to you? Well, SP, care to answer? <laughs> Honestly, it might mean something to you and it might not. But as we mentioned, Google is always changing. What shows up today could be there for the long term or it could change, could disappear. And this would be a short lived thing. But the biggest potential that we see is that your RSS feed could end up higher than your main site in the search results. Now, this could be whether you're hosting your RSS feed via your own site or a media host, but it's something worth to be aware of because what we were mentioning before was that our concern with SEO was that your RSS feed might get a different number of hits and be on a different priority in the search terms, specifically Google, than your main site. So if you're hosting a show on a different media host, uh, Libsyn, Blueberry, Podbean, and the RSS feed is kept there, this could lead people to their page versus your page if you have their page enabled. So that is something definitely worth considering and worth being aware of as a potential because of these search results. Now, why did this happen? This is something that we don't know. Well, we don't know Google. Maybe it's related to their recent change they made where on the podcast, the, the search app, they're now allowing podcast play. Maybe, maybe they've just realized that all of a sudden that people are into podcasting. So they want to make some changes with that and show RSS feeds because people want to stuff it in their podcast catchers. You don't know. We don't know. But ultimately, it is something that we wanted to make sure to mention here because they are definitely showing your RSS feed, which also is important to remember because if somebody stumbles into that you might want to make sure that you have your tags linking back to your main site so if they go in and they see that what is one of the first pieces of code that's in there it could very well be your site tag and so maybe if they happen to stumble it and they see oh okay well i'm, I'm on the better podcasting ellipse in rss and oh what's this first thing in here oh it's betterpodcasting.com they can actually go and type that in um SP mentioned potentially being higher, your RSS feed being higher. This happened to me. When I searched mm. a past project, um, a past project I did, it was a pretty popular comic book podcast called Fanboy Buzz. I decided to search Fanboy Buzz podcast. And sure enough, one of the top results was actually the RSS feed that came before the rest of the site. The RSS feed, again, to reiterate, was above the rest of the site by typing in Fanboy Buzz Podcast. I actually had it as the top result at one of the computers that I tested it in because it's important to remember that Google shows different things uh, for different people, different regions. Results do change. And um, when I was logged into a different computer that was elsewhere, I actually saw it higher as the number one result. My, my former podcast RSS feed was the highest result, which is really weird. So something's going on. Something's changed with Google. We wanted to make sure to mention that um, it is something that you, anytime anybody talks about future proofing, this is just a great example that you just don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. And anytime you have anything, whether it is a media host or whether it is uh, a web hosting of your own service, you don't know what the future is of that. And so you got to make your, your decisions, your pros and your cons. But I think this is just really proof that when you are looking at future proof in your podcast, anything can change. Indeed, anything we've already seen it happen. Episode number one through six, we talked about video podcasting and I mentioned Blab. Blab's gone now. R.A.P. Blab. So no more will we recommend going on Blab because it just doesn't exist. And we've talked significantly in the last couple of dozen episodes to pay attention to the pod space because it is changing, especially with all this new interest in monetization and for with the podcast industry into podcasting for the specific purpose of monetization. Now that they know that people are listening, there is going to be change. We've mentioned that before. So just keep your eyes open and simple things like this. If you're like me and you host with a media host, but yet you want to throw people primarily to a different website, like the guinea website, then that is just all things that you have to consider 
when people are searching for your show. By the way, Stephen, I did notice that the number one result for the fanboy buzz was iTunes, which is still the big aggregator of all podcasts. So that is definitely to be considered as well that iTunes has it transitioned into Apple Podcasts and whatever happens there. Be cognizant and keep your eyes on what's going to happen there because it's going to affect how people find your show. Yeah. So if you want to check out any of the stuff, we've set up some short links. We'll make sure to put the links in our show show docs as we've started to do as well. Uh, Geeks.links slash Google RSS will take you to a a web a companion article I'm going to put on the Gunna Geek site because I want to include screenshots. I want people to be able to see this just because you, I, I think it's it makes it easier for you rather than searching all these things. Uh, the other things that you might want to consider checking out here is the quotes that we talked about. There was a great a, um, analytical article about John Mueller's discussion, which is at geeks.link slash podcast SEO. There's just somebody who analyzed his quote and and really, I think, did a good job of dissecting the need to know on that. As well, if you really want to check out the whole YouTube video, which is fun because maybe it's something now you'll just start to check them out. There's some really neat Google stuff in there. It's geeks.link slash RSS SEO. So that's four four S's RSS SEO, no three S's. Uh, you can you can uh, check that out, which will take you right to the YouTube video. So there you go. We wanted to tackle that because it is it was something, again, that we weren't planning on, but I think it's pretty important to mention considering we both have come across this and that's why we wanted to go ahead and tackle that but that does take us to the end of the download if you've noticed anything like that please get in touch with us because again sp and i have both noticed this so let us know what have you seen uh, how have you how's that affected you you can get in touch with us through any of the ways but let's find out what you had to say about your podcast and the podcast industry this week now and then we have that community that we spoke about earlier in the show just light up and it was definitely one of those weeks including that wonderful voicemail that let us all off from Diami Ploki. Diami, I had to give you give you the top of the show playback for that you know because really when we look at that it's hilarious it's hilarious and that just shows that if you send us something hilarious you're gonna you're gonna get elevated on this show so thank you very much for that Diami. that was awesome Top billing to Diami in he remember he numbers and what we're talking about is he numbers his podcast episodes so that the title can reflect the numbering. I it can be at the beginning, can be at the end, can be in the middle, but the point is it's numbered so it's easily referenced. And we also had a Twitter DM that came in from Emily Prokop. That's right, friend of the show, as we mentioned. Uh, she said thanks for the shout out in the latest BP episode. Such a good episode. And that was the episode about monetization. That was what that was referencing. Yep. Confirmed with her. That is exactly what it was being discussed. There was the episode on you don't have to make money with your show, which if you want to hear all about that, you can go back two episodes to better podcasting number 79. Uh, now, we talked briefly here. We had Diami talk about number. We had Emily talk about money. Well, we had somebody who actually talked about that and more. I'll turn it over to resident email reader, Stargate Pioneer. <coughs> me, 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 me. This email was from Mark, and we received this email after my appearance on the Ritual Misery podcast, which can be found at ritualmisery.com. It was podcast number 128. Mark wrote us and he said, gentlemen. I heard SP on the Ritual Misery podcast and started tuning in. I am enjoying your show so far. A few comments on recent questions and topics that you have raised. Number one, numbering. While I included an episode number in the file name for my own reference, I never refer to it with my audience. I use the date or the title. I keep a list of all my podcasts with that information and find it is also available with all of the podcatchers. It feels less cold to me, but I firmly agree on having some way to reference past episodes is useful indeed. Do you want to address this before we go on, Stephen? No, I think it's a great point. 
I think that it's a great point that everybody's a little bit different um, on how how they're going to reference it. But yeah, I, I I agree. I think, you know, overall, the ref reason why I'm so strong about the numbers is because I, I find it's easy to reference. But hey, if you've got another structure that works, that works for you. That's right. I do like the numbering myself, as we have said before. OK, going on with Mark's email. Number two, money. I think even if you are podcasting as a hobby, that there are valid reasons folks think that they could make money at it. For instance, in my case, I'm a subject matter expert with respect to weather. So it is not far fetched to think I could make money via the podcast platform when I'm discussing a topic where I have expert level knowledge. I think this could apply to many folks who get into podcasting as it is often topics the hosts know quite a bit about. Also, given the simple methods to channel revenue like Patreon and PayPal, it becomes easier to imagine creating a revenue stream even as non-professional podcasters. I will agree with you, Mark, that you can go ahead and monetize your show if you want to. I will caution you that even starting a Patreon up, which is public knowledge, everybody can publicly view what sort of patronage that you are getting, how many people are contributing and what the dollar amount is, that there is a certain, shall we say, snobbery on Patreon, that if you are not getting a certain amount of number of people that are supporting you or dollars, a lot of people will turn their nose about your Patreon. Now, this is just Patreon in general. It's nothing to do with your show or your specific audience, but I would caution you if you're getting less than 500 downloads per show that you might not want to take that foray. But if you do, there's a high likelihood that you're going to go ahead and get a few Patreons to at least pay for your hosting, maybe your website for the year. So at least your hobby is somewhat paid for and in a value for value model that if they are getting value for your show that you are presenting, then they are providing value back and what they're getting out of it, even if it's a dollar, five dollars. So yes, that is doable. Now, we generally don't talk monetization. That's about the most monetization talk that we've ever done on the show in 81 episodes. But I just want to say I will agree with you, but I will have to caveat it that it you need to have some sort of audience before you you kick it off. Yeah, that's a, a good point there. And um, I I guess for me, one of the reasons why I don't spend too much time talking about that is just because of the fact that I've never really worried too much about that. As a hobbyist, I've always gone by that philosophy of if anything happens, it's bonus. So, you know, um, it's it's a great point. It's just for me personally as a hobbyist, I, I, I w I'm with SP on that. It, it's something that you need to have the right circumstances, I think. Okay. So going on to conclude Mark's email, number three, mentors. He didn't have mentors in there. I just put mentors in because <laughs> it was untitled. The whole paragraph is untitled. Mark, you're throwing me off here. Okay. Number three, I don't have any real mentors in the podcasting space, but I think it would be worthwhile. So do we, by the way. In terms of role models, Tom Merritt is my baseline, although I wish I were as good as him and others like Jury and Scott Johnson, which, by the way, are all folks on the Diamond Club Network, are folks I look to for specific style elements. Keep up the great work, Mark. Mark, thanks so much for your email. That was a very thoughtful, that was a very detailed, and that was a very engaging email. We really appreciate your feedback. For sure. Uh, and if you want to send us an email, you can, or your tw a Twitter DM doesn't really matter. What, whatever works for you. We, we just love to hear back from you. Uh, on Twitter, we actually had Geekville Radio saying, watching at Better Pod on YouTube with the captions on makes them appear to be part of, quote, gun, you know, like bang, bang, a uh, geek network. So isn't that funny? We are the gun, a geek network. So there you go. Well, that's just sometimes because Geekville Radio goes on to say also listed Guinea Geek, you know, like <laughs> Guinea Pig, Guinea that's Geek. That's kind of appropriate, but uh, that's funny. I actually, it, it's great timing on this because I literally stumbled into accidentally turning them on for Starling Tribune this past weekend, and I was just laughing at, at some of the ways that it does it. I, to its credit, YouTube does a pretty good job. And I think if you're reading it, you will get 
uh, most idea of what the people were talking about. But it's things like that which come up, which are really funny to, to watch. So thanks for that. Uh, we also had Aurelia, Aurelia Pod, Aurelia Pod, Aurelia Pod. Say DMs were brought up this episode, so I figured I'd poke you about a couple week old message on Facebook. Mm, uh, Steven, that would definitely be in your belly week because I do is. not have access to Facebook. I hate the Facebook Messenger for pages. I gotta say that. I have, this has happened to me on more than one occasion. In fact, I've dug out your message for this episode because I wanted to make sure we addressed that since you brought that up. So thanks so much for that. And I discovered there was another one in there that was missed. They, it, Facebook seems to, on the Messenger notification, only show you messengers for your direct profile. If you accidentally miss the initial, to me, it, what appears is if you miss the initial notification that your page got a message, you got to go in and manually look. And with somebody like ourselves, we're not getting messages on a daily basis, so I don't do that. So I must have missed it. And so I really apologize for this. So what Aurelia Pod said was, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave your name out of it. We'll keep you as Aurelia Pod. Aurelia Pod said to us on Facebook, I'm not sure if here or email is a better way to send this, but I have a topic I'd like covered in some ways. How can you get Google to recognize your name as a valid search? I have adventuresinarelia.com, my podcast on Podbean, and iTunes is Adventures in Aurelia. I'm at Aurelia Pod on Twitter. However, if I Google Adventures in Aurelia in incognito mode, so my browsing history should affect the search. It returns adventures in Aurelia, and I have to make the extra click to tell if I meant to search what I searched. Is there a way to convince Google that I am a valid search term? And also, there was, there was something else in there before we get All to right. that. Go ahead, continue. Right. Also, to tease you guys on the mispronunciation of a made-up word, it's Aurelia. You can clearly hear it in my episode intro. Come on, guys. Last bit, little bit, even though the description on like Amazon says it's a one year warranty, the box for the Knox itself says limited lifetime warranty. I'll include a pick as well in case X SP threw his box away. So thank you very much for that, which uh, I want to get to the simple thing, the microphone. Again, that's geeks.link slash Knox, K-N-O-X. If you want to see SP's review, Hands down, if you're thinking about getting a 2100, save yourself the money, go with the Knox. Um, we can't talk about longevity of Knox, but at this point, they're the same. They, they sound the same. So that's what we're going to suggest that you you do if you're interested in getting it. It sounds phenomenal um, compared to the 2100. So save yourself some money. And also, I know SP did not throw out the box because SP doesn't throw out boxes. He just keeps them. So uh, he does have that. And it it kind of actually reiterates the point that we don't know about the future of Knox, and that's the risk that you're taking. With Audio Technica, the odds are you're going to be able to claim that warranty. Knox says one year warranty, and then they say lifetime. There's confusion there. Which is it? That's not a good sign for a company. They print English language only on there. You plug it into the computer, it shows this is an Audio Technica mic. Your future is unknown with Knox. And so I just wanted to highlight that right now before we get back to the other things. Number two, regarding the mispronunciation. There's a reason I never said it, and I made sure SP did it, so blame SP. And point number three regarding Google, I, I honestly don't know. I, I wish that I knew this because I've actually ran into this before. And what I found is that when I've had this happen, as more links seem to get indexed by Google with this term and more people searched, it seemed to fix itself. Uh, I don't remember which project it was. It was probably going to geek, actually, when I first started it. it. It came up that way, and I never figured it out. There might be a way, but honestly, it's beyond me. Um, but what I did find was as more people had that on their site, so maybe if you've got a, a bit of a network, maybe try to get them to put that on there. That might help. It might uh, get people to try to search for it occasionally. Maybe um, I don't I don't know. I just don't know. I can't say for sure, but I will say that I know that I have seen this before in past projects and it's fixed itself. My best suggestion is just keep on pumping out episodes. Make sure you pump out episode descriptions so that they're perpetrated throughout other podcatchers like Stitcher and TuneIn and Google Play Music that is incorporated into their lexicons. 
And it, I'm not usually a big proponent of this. I'm putting an audio only episode on YouTube, but you might want to do that if your concern is trying to rank a little bit higher in the recognition on a Google search as well. So that's all things that I can recommend doing. And I think over time, you're going to be looking at something which might rank higher in the search engines to at least Google recognizing it on the first three pages of the search. For sure. And again, I, I mentioned we got a lot of feedback this week and I I hate to do this to people, but we will get to some more of it next week because if you didn't hear your feedback, we are going to come back to it. We have a whole bunch of other stuff. It was a very busy week, but we will end the, the better pod back with one more voicemail. Let's go ahead and play that. Hello, Stephen and SP. This is Joe McGarry from the Two Bald Pastors podcast. And I want to share with you today how I saved our podcast. And if you recognize my name and my podcast, it's because I won the Audio-Technica headphones earlier this year. My co-host Jeff and I are both bald and we are both pastors. And the theme of our podcast is to help folks connect their faith with their life. We started in November of 2015. Neither one of us had any experienced podcasting, so we were both learning on the fly. In December of 2015, we landed a huge interview with a national touring band, and they had been playing for over 30 years together all around the country, all around the world, and they were coming to my church to do a concert, and it was their final weekend of touring. After this weekend, they were going to disband. And so they agreed to do a podcast interview with us, and we were so excited. We sat down, I hooked everything up, and we sat down for the interview. And this is the first time that we were doing an in-person interview. Up to then, everything was done via Skype. Well, in my inexperience, I totally messed up the audio so badly that it was unusable. This was a 45-minute conversation. We were laughing, we were joking. It was a fantastic interview, and I was devastated because it was totally gone. Thankfully, I remembered one of the people traveling with them put a Zoom recorder on the table near us to record the conversation. So I reached out to him and asked him if we could use the audio for our podcast, and he thankfully agreed. It wasn't the best produced podcast episode, but it was an amazing conversation, and I was so happy that we were able to share it with our podcast listeners. That's how I saved my podcast. Thank you for letting me share. So I got to say, loved this story when it came in because so many cool elements with it, and also. The other thing is, this is a situation where a very, very unrecreatable circumstance was saved because somebody happened to have it. So that's looking at sort of the situation and, and what, what could I have done? How could I have, have salvaged this? And he, obviously there is a massive amount of luck. Like, I'm just going to say it right now. That is a very lucky situation. Um, but you remember that it was there. So such a good story and yeah okay maybe it wasn't the best quote unquote produced podcast but in a situation like this i will say i will take a, an old saying that i used to hear which was the best camera is the camera you have on you when you're salvaging a podcast the best microphone and audio is the audio that you have like if that's what you have that's what you have if it is that important there are even situations where maybe it is it is extremely rough and you just need to go in and you need to caution your listeners and just, you know, if somebody new coming in saying this is not the usual standard, but this is what happened. I'm just telling you straight up how it is. And I want to make sure you hear the content. That's important. And so that's why it's a little bit different. But the content is what I want you to hear. And you just have to acknowledge it. And, and you know, you don't you don't want to be apologizing each episode. But where you have that one off circumstance like that, it's OK to do it because Again, obviously, this is a very important uh, thing that you needed to have your show and you almost lost it. So kudos on salvaging that. Kudos indeed, Pastor Joe. And also, 
And this could be a little lesson reminder to everybody out there that if you're doing a live sort of recording, especially your first time out, you might want to figure out some way to monitor that recording or have a producer as well. I've spoke about it as our Indiana Comic Con wrap up that I would prefer to have had an actual producer on site. I have used an on site producer before. I know how valuable they are. If you can't do it, then definitely uh, putting in even earbuds in and sensing what's coming out of your recorder are, is probably better than uh, not monitoring at all. But that's all hindsight is 2020 Monday morning quarterbacking, Tuesday morning quarterback or whatever it is called in the NFL these days when they have seven games a week on seven days a week. But yeah, that's amazing story, Joe. Thank you very much for sharing. And if you have a story on how you saved your podcast, go ahead and send it into us at podcast at betterpodcasting.com. And again, we're going to go ahead right now and give you a bit of hashtag pod pressure to send us an audio or video clip. Again, that's hashtag pod pressure. Bringing back the hashtag pod pressure. Stephen the Enabler, the Canadian, I have a sense that you've been a drug runner in a previous life. No, not at all. But uh, that's going to go ahead and wrap up the show. Before but we wait. wrap up, I think we need to talk about the elephant in the room, at least the elephant in the room for you video viewers at, at SP. I'm going to turn this over to you. You know the reason why. So Stephen had a hankering. He had a something in the back of his mind that he just wanted to be able to test out and share. So for a birthday present, I sent him a Heil PR40, but it's not just any Heil PR40. It is a... Yes, it is the High LPR 40 BG, also known as the Golden High LPR 40. There is a complete gold version. This is not. I actually like the look of this a little bit better. It's black with a gold grill on it. Steven, how did you like the sound of the High LPR 40 this episode? And what did you do to integrate it into your studio? Okay, so first off, Emily. I understand you were in on it and you recorded that and sent that over. So I, oh, I love it. I'm just going to play it again. Once again, that's Emily Prokoff from the Story Behind Pod. Go ahead and catch that out. It's a great right. podcast. There you go. That's three shout outs in this episode, Emily. So there you go. You got three. Uh, so. I got to say, um, I, I this is the first time I've really, really used it. I had pulled it out for a test up until now, and that was it. And it sounds it sounds good. Now, I, I'll have to hear it back. You know, I, I think, to be honest, there's some some elements of some qualities that I anticipated before about the Heil PR40. But as a guy who does not have a large, boomy, bassy voice, it, it works for me. I, I The Heil PR40, a lot of times I feel like people who have the big, boomy, bassy voice don't always sound the greatest on the PR40. But to me so far, I'm very intrigued with what I hear. And I can't wait to keep testing. I'm going to do it. It's, it's going to be my go to mic for the next month, at least, and, and try it out and, and really dial it in. Because to answer your second question, the DBX 286 that I, I run this microphone into my preamplifier, I only have compression and gating on. I do not have any enhancement on. The switches are off. The LF detail, so the low frequency detail, and the HF detail, the high frequency detail, are both turned off. So I'm not <gasps> enhancing that right now. And I'm gonna I'm gonna dial. I'm gonna play like I always do. I really want to give this a shot. This is really SP in my first experience with the PR40, and I think that it's only fair to really spend some quality time trying to dial it in. So uh, it is it is awesome. And uh, SP, you you know my gratitude. I do indeed, sir. And by the way, it, Stephen is following the advice of Bob Heil himself, who says the microphone was meant to be used without any EQ. So there we go. Let us know what you think. You can get in touch with us through a variety of different ways. You can find us at facebook.com slash better podcasting. You can tweet us at better pod. Send us an email. It doesn't really matter. Just wherever you would like to, please let us know. What did you think about this? And, you know, as, as I change things e each week, feel free to give me ongoing feedback about the. Audio and singing provided by Emily Prokoff.
of the story behind podcast. But that is taking us to the end of the show. Before we wrap up, we'll just go ahead and remind you that we're part of the Gunna Geek Network. A lot of really great geeky content on there, including some new members of the network. So please check that out at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. But that is the end of the show for episode 81 of Better Podcasting. <laughs> I'm Stephen John Drew. And I'm Stargate Pioneer. I am not getting up to dance at Hulu. Bye. Bye. See you guys next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of Better Podcasting. We want to hear from you. You can find all of our contact information at betterpodcasting.com. If you like the show, please consider giving us a five-star review in iTunes. We encourage you to check out all of the other geeky podcasts available at gunnageeknetwork.com. This has been a Gunna Geek production. Thanks for listening, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>